Very good afternoon, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Daphne M. Eiking, as you can see clearly from my IC over here. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, oh, I have to press harder. Oh, okay, where do I point? Okay. Mm -hmm. Why do we carry our IC around? Now, growing up in Sabah, I have my grandmother, my Odu, who would always say, Bah! Bagus kamu bawa kau punya IC kama, nanti kamu kena tangkap itu polis. Do ingat kau orang pilak. For those of you who are not Sabahans and need me to translate it, it basically means you better carry your IC around, otherwise the police might think you are a pilak. Now, pilak. Okay. Why is it not going to my next slide? Okay, let me see. Oh, there you go. Pilak actually means silver or money in Tagalog. But actually, in Sabah, pilak is used in a rather derogatory manner to label the illegal immigrants or the PTIs, the parties. Pendatang asing tanpa izin. Pendatang asing tanpa izin, alright? So, I think what the more politically correct or ethnically correct term that my grandmother should have used is actually to call them um, undocumented immigrants or children of migrant workers. There's another reason why I didn't, uh, you know, never left my IC at home, even if it was to the Kadairun Cheta na Blakang Kampung Saya, because of my grandmother's, you know, constant nagging. We also lived in the police barracks. My dad was an ex-cop. And I used to see all these pilaks or the PTIs getting hauled up in the raids because most of them were criminals or they didn't have or carry popular, uh, you know, proper documentations. Hence, me being scared of being hauled up as a pilak if I never brought my IC. So that is the reason why I carry my IC around. And I think I've taken this blue card of mine for granted. And I should really, really feel blessed. And all of you here should feel grateful that you own this because you have a sense of belonging. You all have citizenship, be it Malaysian or being a foreigner. We are not stateless. Now, being stateless means that you have no access to education, to medical help, to getting a job, to getting a banking loan, and to own a car or a house. You can't even get married legally. So can you imagine why most of the PTIs are criminals? How are they able to feed and clothe themselves if they do not have the means to do so? They beg, borrow or steal, ladies and gentlemen, and that is the horrible truth. According to the UN Refugee Agency or UNHCR, one stateless child is born every 10 minutes. In West Malaysia alone, at least 10,000, these are just recorded, the ones that we don't have in our data, only 10,000, 10, at least 10,000 are denied citizenship, okay? And again, what does it mean to be a stateless person? It means that you have no access to education, to medical care, you can't go into a hospital. Even if you did have money, which I doubt, you won't have that because you just don't. And, and you basically are deprived from having a decent living. Things have changed, admittedly. Uh, kids, uh, stateless kids are allowed to go to school, but we'll get into that in just a bit because that's a different story altogether. So today, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to be talking about the state of statelessness here in Malaysia and some of the crucial steps that are required to stop it, okay? And making sure that no child is left behind. However, first and foremost, I know it seems very dry, I just want you to realize that straight statelessness has a few categories involved. We've got those stateless people who are born or arrived before Medeka or Malaysia Day. We've got persons who have lost or don't have important documents like their birth certs or marriage certificate because ada juga yang kawin sana kampung kan style kampung kampung the ketua kampung marries them off but it's not legally registered per se so that's another problem altogether. Children of mixed marriages or children before marriage was registered they are considered stateless. Those born 
out of wedlock are also considered stateless. We've got the indigenous people, the orang asli, are also considered stateless because, hey, they're, they're living in the jungle. Why would they go and get a birth certificate, right? And then, of course, we have the abandoned children or the foundlings and adopted children uh, born here in Malaysia, but they too aren't able to get their citizenship. And of course, we've got our PTIs or our, uh, refugees and our migrants, but that's actually quite a smaller number compared to the other above categories that we have. Ladies and gentlemen, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. Am I right? We all agree to that, right? We all have our rights to live a decent living. And I guess I was not the only one that thought this way. When TV personality and I, uh, Lisa Suryani and I uh, came on board to try and find ways to end statelessness, we came with extremely ambitious minds. Okay? We said to ourselves, you know, it's really inhuman that people are, these stateless people are being uh, deprived from their rights. I mean, I'm sure, right, if we put it on our social media, can, and then sure the leaders will listen, uh, and then after that, bam, everyone will be granted citizenship. We thought we were so powerful like that. Lah. Okay? Spoke to Dr. Hartini Zainuddin as well as Said Azmi. Some of you are familiar with them. They are amazing, amazing child advocates. And we were talking back and forth, back and forth over our WhatsApp. And we decided that we needed to strip it down to basics. Lisa's mom actually was in one of our meetings and she said, Eh, apa perspective Islam dalam statelessness ni, isu isu is statelessness ni? And we were like, you're right. Because although here in Malaysia we promote a secular interpretation of the federal constitution, let's just admit it, we've got sectors out there who believe that the Sharia courts and the Islamic law is more supreme. And that's just how it is. So we're going to play along with that line. We're just going to try and, you know, use that to lobby and to make some noise with regards to this issue of statelessness. So we set up an appointment with the Mufti KL, uh, Dr. Sri Dr. Zulkifli Al Bakri and his team, and he was just amazing. Ya Allah, Alhamdulillah. He and his team actually came up with an article just last week, and he said, if I can quote, give citizenship to the founding. So it's there, it's very small print, you don't have to read everything, I just summarized it for you. His suggestion to the government was, give citizenship to these abandoned children and he actually put in it's a very long article if you are rajin go and check it out those who are christians and muslims will be familiar with the story of moses nabi musa who was an abandoned child and was taken up by the pharaoh so it is part of an islamic good will to actually help these foundlings and they are very very innocent and they need our help Okay, so that was a suggestion. Our community's responsibility to look after the foundings, do not punish them. Do not deprive them from this right, their dignity to live a decent life. Of course, we were happy. We were like, oh my God, alhamdulillah, yeah, ah, oh, ah, oh, ah. Oh. And then Said Azmi goes on the WhatsApp, I can quit now being a child advocate and get a real job. And we're like, woohoo. We're going to show this to, you know, the ministries. We're going to say, see, we're going to get the other Islamic leaders to be on board. And after that, we're going to go to church. We're going to go to temples. We're going to do this. We all thought, like, we'll use religion for a good way to make sure that we will end the state of, state, the state of statelessness here in Malaysia. Unfortunately, it was not that easy. Allah. We went to meet up with the Keluarga Pembangunan Wanita, Keluarga dan Masyarakat, met up with uh, Yabu Hamad Hanayo, and she told us that it's not going to be so easy to grant citizenship. I think Tun, you will know this, it's been a back and forth uh, issue. It's not going to be easy to grant every Malaysian's citizenship because there's so many factors involved. She said, of course, nicer lah. She's very soft-spoken, that lady. This is one of the articles. I'm going to step out because I can't see. I forgot my glasses. I'm going to step out for the red ring. I'm so sorry to the cameraman over there. But you can hear my voice. This is 
a snippet of an article that came up uh, a few months ago, if I'm not mistaken, and it says that uh, Malaysia will not be responsible and burden the citizenship issues of foreign nationals who intentionally refuse to deal with their child's identification problems or documents from their country of origin. So they're basically saying that those foundlings who may or may not be citizens of Malaysia, we're going to assume that they're going to be nationalities from different countries, not Malaysia. So it's their problem. Don't tak pikir. They are abandoned. Abandoned. How are we to know whether they are from country X, Y or Z? Betul tak? Our country is broke, Daphne. Our finances are depleted because you know lah, I won't go there lah. <laughs> Malaysians will complain. Malaysians kan suka complain. Talk, 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 talk. Everything also, nothing is good for them. And of course, there's the issue of safety and security here in Malaysia. Sensitive, definitely tak boleh, tak boleh. These were some of the things that were coming out. And I was so, feeling so dejected. Imagine Lisa and I coming on board like, yeah, we're going to do this. Oh my God, we got an appointment with the ministry. Oh my God. Because at the end of the day, I mean, of course, we got our foot in with Mufti KL. We got our foot in with the uh, Wanita uh, ministry. At the end of the day, it's home affairs that's going to seal the deal. And I'm Sabahan, by the way, as you all would probably know from early on. Project IC, this is such a sensitive and highly politicized issue in my state of Sabah because we've got a lot of the PTIs overpopulating the state of Sabah and a lot of Sabahans are, although we are very encouraging in that sense where we had the first One Malaysia concept even before our previous Prime Minister had introduced that One Malaysia concept, we like, oh, kita okay, saya tidak tahu tu kalau kau Islam, kau kau Buddhist, kau kau, we were cool. I'm sad to say that we are slightly a little bit racist when it comes to this bilax. The actual word alone is very racist. All right. So the pro uh, project I see is the granting of citizenship to immigrants, legal or otherwise, making it more favorable to certain political parties. So that is the reason why it's a big no-no in Sabah. They'll, they'll say, if you're going to grant them, then how? And then, oh, you know, it's just, it's just very very highly politicized, okay? The development of human resource for rural areas, or DRA, has actually come up with an amazing comprehensive handbook on how to resolve statelessness in Malaysia. It requires high intensity of collaboration between stateless people, the government, stakeholders, and of course, political will. That was supposed to create some effect, like boom, like that. But I don't know how to do it. Sorry, yeah. I do like boom. Okay, come, I do again one more time. Boom. Ah, political will. It needs political will, y'all. Again, I'm not going to read. I'm not going to get through the uh, fine uh, lines here. Fine printing. Fine print. <laughs> But these are some of the categories. Again, I'm sorry, I'm stepping out from my red box. You can hear my voice. These are some of the stages required in order for us to end statelessness. Again, this is in the draw handbook. It involves JPN. It requires a new set of standard operation procedures. It requires the home ministry. It requires the cabinet. It requires our lawmakers to pass laws in our parliament. So can you see the, the, the amount of stages that we have to go through in order for us to stop or to grant citizenship to those deserving Malaysians out there. I, I don't even like saying deserving Malaysians because by right, everyone in the world should be granted a citizenship regardless. Thank you. So it seems like a very long road ahead. So here I am. Maybe I'm just back to square one. Why Bihana is correct. I'm going to take up her suggestion and we're going to focus on founding. So we're going to narrow it down. Let's not just be too ambitious. Um, ambitions. Oh, joy. Sayang. Dan. After I tell you a little bit of a joke nanti, ya, because I want to be like Douglas Lim. Um, <laughs> focus on foundlings because uh, foundlings are the easiest group to tackle, right? They are the most vulnerable and the most need of protection through citizenship. They're so innocent. Surely, it's going to be easier for foundlings. So again, Lisa, Sai Azmi, Dr. Hati ni semua, yay, okay lah, tak apa, kita sikit-sikit, kita main sikit-sikit. We don't jump through, we just play-play a little bit like that, play water. 
you know, we'll try and tackle them first because abandoned babies on Malaysian soil, Jusoli, which is basically the right of anyone born in the territory of a country is entitled to the nationality or citizenship. But that, I mean, born ma, Malaysian soil, that means you are Malaysian. So I asked, I asked YB and I said, it's surely that easy, right, to comprehend? She went, uh -huh. no. So that's just it. This law of the soil does not apply to the foundlings. Ladies and gentlemen, it's so, so weird that we have this federal constitution. I've been reading it back and forth, back and forth every time. I'm, you know, I feel so dejected. It is stated in our federal constitution that every person born within the federation is stateless after the first year of their birth is entitled to citizenship automatically. Okay, that's my summary from the whole articles that are found with regards to citizenship here in Malaysia. And yet thousands, ladies and gentlemen, in West Malaysia alone, 10,000, at least 10,000 people are still stateless. And it has to do with this. There are administrative guidelines or procedures regarding the implementation of the relevant constitution uh, provisions. There are no guidelines. So we've got all this. I'm going to, oh, there, I've got that red, red thing. We've got all these that safeguards to prevent statelessness in the Malaysian federal constitution, and yet we're not implementing it. What is the damn problem? These are some of the gaps and the problems that we have with regards to statelessness. Processing period. I know one lady who's been trying and trying and trying. It's about four years now. Uh, repeated rejections. The worst is when they're rejected, there are no reasons given. Uh, this, the form. Article 14b is not even issued. I'm going to get into that with a sample later on. There's no standard to access the language proficiency because according to the federal constitution, you are granted citizenship provided that, wait, uh, if you can speak Malay lah. But then, what exactly is how much? You cakap satu, dua, tiga, that is Melayu mah? Is that enough? Or how, how, what, what is it? All right, uh, individuals with criminal records are rejected. Again, look, all the PTIs, for instance, for instance, instance, huh? If they've got a record of stealing, that's it. Because also in the constitution, you have to have good character. Again, a little bit vague there. Persons with my cast are not allowed to apply. Inconsistent procedures at NRD, depending. Suka tingkau lah. Kalau your officer tu baik mood dia, dapat lah. Kalau tak dapat, sorry, bye-bye. No new reasons whatsoever on why it's been rejected. And of course, the process is very long. Uh, there's no legal marriage. Like I said, there's one or two who actually emailed me and said, like, my, my parents kawin kampung kampung, but they, don't, they didn't register marriage, and because of that, there's no proof, and they're wedlock, they're illegitimate, and that makes them stateless. And an inability to provide proof. There's also gender discrimination. We're not going to get into that so much, but there is, because I'm running out of time. So basically, ladies and gentlemen, the federal constitution is not being implemented, which is very, very frustrating. Laws are man-made, statelessness caused by the policy can be amended with political will. Now, if you think that stateless people are the PTIs, the migrants, the foreigners, are mostly that, you are wrong because the stateless people in Malaysia are those that have a deep, genuine connection to Malaysia. This is one of the samples that I'm telling you about. Her name is Sharon. Okay, whoops, I just mentioned her name. It's supposed to be Lady X, but anyway, you all don't know her. Sharon lost the original Kampung Surat Kawin. And because of that, all her other siblings have I, um, identical cards, but for her, because she was born in 1997, her, uh, sorry, she was born 1996, but her registration of her parents was 1997, and then because they didn't have, the, the surat went missing during a flood in Sabah, or something like that. But it's basically, again, she's not there because she crossed borders, it was just pure bad luck. But things are slowly moving. We've got the zero reject policy. Our education ministry has mentioned that they will allow stateless children to enroll in school. However, there are terms and conditions. Only make sure that at least one Malaysian parent, uh, either adopted or is the parent, uh, biological parent, but they're not eligible to aid. Textbook schemes, supplementary food program or other systems, they're not eligible to that. Not only that, but if they are not able to provide their documentation within two years, Bye-bye. Kalau macam tu, baik tak payah hantar. Kan? Because it's not an equal playing field. 
there's discrimination. So this zero reject policy is meaningless if it does not mean quality and appropriate education for all. This is a story of about Mark, very quickly. He was one of our cases uh, early this year and they enrolled him, he's a stateless, his mother adopted him. And then the teacher actually said, oh, call them up and said, you better come here, take your anak. And we said, why? Because, you know, we we takut kena saman. So do not punish the child. They could have done something nicer in, 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 instead of just, you know, making him wait at the office. The mother came in and was, of course, very frantic and very upset with the whole thing. Again, I know it's teething problems right now. It's just been introduced, this new policy. But still, we've got a lot to work out. And the thing here is, the thing here is, this was not in a rural school. This was a school in Bangsa. Going back to Hana, no child is left behind. We've got to nip it by the bud. This is her plans. We need to curb baby dumping. Now, I work with a lot of unwed pregnant mothers, and this is something that I've been championing for a lot of times. Uh, out of all these kids, uh, I think it was about 35.8% of kids from 2010 to 2018. We've got all those baby, dump, uh, baby dumping cases. The highest dumping where we noticed was during October and November. I really need to get this message across. I know I've got a little bit more time. I need to get this across because we are in a university. We've got youth leaders here and teachers. I want you to all know this. The highest amount of baby dumping was during November and December. If you track that backwards, nine months before that, it falls somewhere in between February, January, end of January, early February. What is happening in February? Or Valentine baby. So the, cam- the ministry is coming up with a say no to Zina. And I've got a big problem with this because one is very discriminatory in that sense. Because, oh, whoa, say no to this, you know, it's, it's all bad, bad, bad. And when I talk to all these unwed pregnant mothers where they are almost dying because they're playing a hanger up their vagina to try and abort their child because that's the only method they know how to. It's because of stigma. It's because of discriminatory. They're scared, they're fierce. So I don't quite agree, quite honestly, to this messaging because I know that we need to do more. We need to educate our youths. We have more youths who are sexually active and that is just the matter, that's just the honest fact and we need to educate them about contraception and practicing safe sex if they are already sexually active and basically the risk of unplanned pregnancies, okay? Statelessness does not mean you're stupid or you're a, crime, uh, a criminal. This is Rosia Abdullah. She is a 21-year-old straight-A student. She applied three times for her citizenship in eight years. She was rejected. She was one of the lucky ones. Her pan- parents abandoned her. She was adopted. Uh, luckily for her, she was still able to get to school and go for exams. Not many people, stateless kids are allowed that. But she was granted that. And she, stra- she's, she passed. She got straight A's. But she can't. She doesn't have any documentation. And it's sad because when you're 21 and you're below, you can still try and apply for a citizenship, but after that, when you're an adult, you're 21 years old, the chances of you ever getting a citizenship is super low. This means there's a waste of potential, waste of human development, uh, human capital, as well as development opportunities. So ladies and gentlemen, if development matters, statelessness matters too. <sighs> How many minutes do I have? Okay, very quickly. At the end of the day, political will is what's crucial over here. That is what the critical evolution is required, ladies and gentlemen. If Pakatan Harapan, I'm not being saying this because I'm here or A or B or whatever, Pakatan Harapan actually said that that was part of their manifesto uh, when they, you know, went for elections and stuff. They said that they will end statelessness. And so far, it's a little bit too slow for my liking, but never mind, everyone's teething problems. They've already granted those with the red card 60 years and above to be given their citizenship. That's still a real slow move. But this is still a positive example of political will. Uh, baby dumping, baby dumpling, baby dumping, sorry, baby, they're so cute, huh? like dumpling like that, I see some of them like, oh, see, I'm baby dumping can, I mean, ending baby dumping can eventually end statelessness, but it is not the end to the existing problems of statelessness, so at the end of the day, it's all about political will, ladies and gentlemen, so I want you to take out your social media and just spread the news, not many people want to talk about it, but it is so vital, let's not deprive them from their human rights. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen.